Amen. Amen. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn together to the Old Testament book of Ezra. I pray that you have enjoyed our time here in this book. It's certainly a great book of the Bible, isn't it? It's one of my favorites. And uh, I love I love all the great things that God teaches us. And He's brought us a long way, hasn't He? If you turn back to chapter 1, we're going to do a brief recap here as this morning we'll close out uh, the study here as we've made our way uh, through this particular book. Of course, we began in chapter 1 where uh, God allowed the children of Israel to return back to the land of Judah, back to Jerusalem. And the Bible says in verse 3, I've got two words marked there. He says, go up. Go up. God has commanded them to go up and, and return back to their place, back to the place where uh, of promise, back where there's a job to be done. And he says in verse 5, So the people rose up to go up. They followed the Lord in, in obedience. And as we go back, as we turn to chapter 3, we find that upon their arrival back to uh, Judah, as soon as they arrived, they did something of great significance. And this is something that you and I ought to do as well, or endeavor to do in our own lives and in our homes. The Bible tells us in verse 2 that they built the altar. Built the altar of God. That altar is a, a place of significance. It's a place of sacrifice. A place of, of renewed fellowship with God. A place of prayer. A place of communion with the Lord. And as Christian people, the Lord's allowed us to return so we can commune with Him. You know, the reality is we don't have to use this building to commune with God. You and I, we're the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in us. We've been bought with a price. Uh, but God wants us to learn the importance of communing with Him and, and taking and enjoying this time of fellowship with God. And as, they, as we look ahead there, even in chapter 3, the Bible says that they set forward the work. There was a work to be done, wasn't there? It was a great work. They were going to go and they were going to rebuild the temple of God. But the, right, the truth of the matter is, before they could ever set forward the work, they had to take care of something. And in verse number 9, the Bible says to set forward the workmen. You and I will never do a work for God if we do not set ourselves forward. In other words, we need to take care of ourselves. And not in a, in a humanistic sense. We must take care of ourselves spiritually. We must prepare ourselves, prepare our hearts to serve the Lord. We must not substitute uh, service. We must, must not put service in the place of spirituality. God wants us to be a spiritual people and not carnally minded at all. But as you look ahead, even through the, we find that they built the temple and that, that God used Haggai and Zechariah to encourage the people in their building, even though the work ceased, even though there was opposition. God used those two preachers and the work prospered under their leadership. But in chapter 7, we're introduced to a very special person. A man named Ezra. The Bible tells us there that he was a ready scribe. But more significantly, it tells us that God's hand was upon his life. <clears throat> now, do you want God's hand on your life? I cannot tell you how desperately I crave God's hand on my life. You know, the greatest thing that you could ever know is God's hand of blessing. To see God work through your life in a very special way and we saw, how, saw the reason why God chose to use a man by the name of Ezra. The Bible tells us in verse 10 of chapter 7, For he, because, for, God blessed him for a reason. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. But then we find that in chapters 8 and 9, that God's attention was moved from the man, Ezra, and placed upon the body of people. Ezra talked about me. Now he was talking about us. And I pray that God would bless us as a church. And you know, I want God's blessing on my life. And that might be selfish to say, but I do. Oh man, I do. But as I look around this building here this morning, as I, as I look at every individual member of this local church, you know what I want? 
want God's hand of blessing upon us. What does it take for God to bless His people? Why did God bless the remnant as they returned? Well, the Bible tells us that they fasted and prayed for God's leadership. They consecrated themselves to the Lord. They set themselves apart unto God. And last week, as we came to chapter number 9, in verse number 8, look there again, if you would please. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 8. We came to the reason behind it all. We've gone through a lot, haven't we? We look, we take a an observation, or we make us take a survey of modern Christianity, and we truly parallels the times in which Ezra lived and ministered. Why did God allow the remnant to return? We're told why in verse number 8 of chapter 9. Notice there again, it says, And now, for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in His holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Had the children of Israel not returned, had, not, had God not given them that little space of time, that, that short period, that little blip in eternity, their faith would have been lost forever. But God raised up Ezra, and they went back, and there was a reviving, there was a reinstituting of, of, of the sacrifices, of the laws of God, of the commandments of God. Why? Because God wants to do for us what He did for Ezra. Look there in verse number nine, right in the heart of the verse, it says to leave us. I'm sorry, to sh- and uh, to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us notice a nail in His holy place. God wants to give us a nail in His holy place. I don't want my faith, which is this book, the God of this book. I don't want my faith to become extinct. Do you want your faith to become extinct? I don't. Truth must be contended for in every generation. And if we do not contend for the truth, if we do not stand for the truth, if we do not teach our children the truth, it will be gone. You ever wonder why Christianity is the way it is today, where it's all fog machines and strobe lights and loud music. You know why? Because we have failed to teach our children this book. In the book of Hosea, God tells us, He says, my my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I don't want there to be a lack of knowledge in the generation to come. We must learn to make the distinction between the holy and the profane. We need God's grace. We need God's help. Because what do we want to be? What do you want to be? I decided several years ago that I no longer care what the world thinks. You know what? Life is so much easier when you don't care what the world thinks. I decided several years ago to only care what God thinks. And as a people, what do we want to be? I don't want to be a follower of Christ and, and mingle everything that I do and intermingle it with the world and the world's systems and the world's thinking, the world's philosophies. Just how can two walk together except they be agreed? What light or what fellowship hath light with darkness? What Agreement had the temple of God with idols. Right? We're to be separate. And as we consider what God wants us to be, you know what we ought to be? We simply need to be biblical. Just purely and simply biblical. Is God's Word right? Is God's Word truth? Then we can never go wrong being biblical. You will never be wrong as a lover and follower of truth. Because truth always prevails. But as we come to chapter 10 this morning of Ezra, 
we find that Ezra was confronted with a problem. That's why he was praying last week. In Ezra 9, it, it, uh, it highlights his prayer. The prayer he prayed to God. The prayer he prayed for the people. The prayer for revival. But in Ezra chapter 10, we come to the place of decision. A place where we all must choose. A place where God draws the line in the sand. And He asks us to to pick. What will you pick this morning? Will you pick God's blessing? Or will you choose the pleasures of sin for a season? If we choose the former, we'll never know what God wants. We will never know God's best. If you choose the pleasures of sin, if you choose friendship with the world, mark my words, you will never know God's blessing on your life. Because our sin hinders God's work. What does God seek to accomplish? He wants to give us that nail in His holy place. You know what God wants to give us? He wants to give us revival. Do you want revival or don't you? What is it going to take? If you're able, I invite you to stand with me this morning as we read together here in God's Word. Beginning in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 1, we'll read down through verse number 5. Notice what the Bible says. Again, beginning in Ezra chapter 10 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now when Ezra had prayed... And when he had confessed weeping and casting himself down before the, before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. For the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage. Do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests and Levites of Israel to swear that they should do according to this to this word. And they swear. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning, God. We're thankful for its power. God, I'm thankful that it's truth. And Lord, this morning may truth win in our hearts and lives. God, may your truth bring us the place of correct choosing, of right application this morning. Lord, of proper decision. Lord, I pray for myself, I pray for these who are here, that you would help us do the right thing. God, help us follow you in obedience this morning and do the things we ought to do. The things that would glorify you, the things that would not limit your working. The things I believe will truly Allow us to tap into the the power of God, the immeasurable power of God. Lord, our prayer is that You'd be glorified this morning and that You'd help us. Lord, open our eyes that we may behold marvelous things from Your law. Help us to walk in truth today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles, I'd like to draw your attention to what the Bible says in verse number 2. Now, it may seem like a very hopeless situation that the children of Israel find themselves in. They, were in, they, were, they had been in captivity for 70 years. Yet God in His mercy and in His grace allowed them to return to the land. And they were, they were in captivity for those years because of their sin. Because of their neglect for the things of God. And now, as they return, they find themselves in the same situation. 
They had mingled themselves with the people of the land. They had taken wives of the people of the land. Now they have children, and it's just, it's just, it's just a messy situation. It seems hopeless. And Ezra, he's, he's heartbroken. What would you do? What can you do? But there's a promise found in verse number 2. Look what the Bible says. And I'm thankful that what the, word, what the Word of God says, notice the last expression of the verse. The Bible says, Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Yet now there is hope. Hope. Aren't you thankful for hope? You know what the world needs today? The world needs hope. You know what you and I need today? We need a fresh understanding of what hope is. You know, like the songwriter put it, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly cling to Jesus' name. And Christians, so long as Christ is alive, which the Bible tells us that He's alive forevermore, so long as Jesus is alive, there is hope for you and for me. There is hope for revival. There is hope that everything's going to work out okay. But what is hope? What is hope? Hope is, is the expectation of what you seek for. It's the assurance that you're going to find it. That you're going to have it. That you'll enjoy it. It's hope. I have the hope of salvation. My hope is is in what Jesus Christ has done for me. I know that my last breath in this world will be my first in Jesus' presence where I will spend the rest of my eternity. I have that hope. My hope is, not, is, 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 based, upon, my hope is based upon the promise, upon the foundation of God's Word. Friends, do you have hope this morning? As we consider what God is wanting to do. He wants us to have this hope. There is hope. There is hope in Israel concerning this thing, as the Word of God tells us. What is this thing? That the children of Israel, that this Jewish remnant, they'll just do what's right. And if they do what's right, it's going to be okay. Do you believe that? If you do what's right in your life, that it's going to be okay. Anybody? Do you realize that God honors obedience? And sometimes we have to make very difficult decisions in order to be obedient. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, this book is counterculture. Bible Christianity goes against the grain of what the world wants you to think and believe and do. If you're going to obey it, you're going to pay a price. You will. But what price are you willing to pay? You realize there are certain things I'm willing to endure for the sake of truth, for the sake of God, for the sake of my family, for the sake of my children. You know, sometimes we have the wrong idea. Well, if I do, if I do what the Bible says here, then I can't do any of that stuff. And you know, my life's going to be boring. I'm going to miss out on all kinds of things. Well, if that's the way you look at it, you're right. You know what? I am going to miss out on some things if I obey the Word of God. I'm going to miss out on a lot of heartache and regret that sin brings. I'm going to miss out on all the guilt and all the, all the things that sin entraps me with. Because I'm going to choose to honor God with my life. Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Listen to what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 1 of Psalm 78. 
It says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which ye have heard and known, and your fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God. Did you mark that statement this morning? There in verse number 7. Psalm 78, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Hope in God. Why is there hope? Because our hope is in God. If your hope is not in God, you have no hope. Do you want hope today that everything is going to be okay? That it's all going to work out? Then place your hope in God. And do what He says. Look look again in verse 7. He says that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. You know what the Lord is telling us? He's he's saying, listen, I want you to obey. I've heard several definitions of what revival is, haven't you? I like revival. I like to read about revival. I like to hear preachers preach about revival. Some preachers would say that revival is a return, a Christian's return to normal. Right? Well, what's normal for a Christian? Do you remember how excited you were when you first accepted Christ? Do you remember how thrilled your heart was and, and how you couldn't wait to follow the Lord and identify with Him and, and serve Him? Pretty exciting times, right? God wants you to return to normal. That excitement, that love, that fervency for Christ, that zeal for the Lord, that's only normal behavior. And yet the world crowds Christ out of our lives. And what we need is a return to normal. I've also heard revival defined as a new beginning of obedience to God. Obedience. Is there any better way for the Christian to live than in obedience to the Lord? Who are you? Whose are you? Friends, the only logical, the only logical thing for the Christian to do is to live a life of obedience to God. And if you'll do that, if you'll trust God, take Him at His word, guess what you have? You have a sweet four-letter word that the world is constantly looking for, but is only found in Christ. You know what it is? It's hope. Hope. There's hope. Aren't you thankful there's hope? Because there is hope, there are three things that you and I ought to do. Notice the first one's found back in Ezra chapter 10. Look what the Bible says in verses 1 and 2. You see, you and I, we ought to recognize the magnitude of our sin recognize the magnitude 
of our sin. Look what the Bible says, the end of verse number 1. What did the people do? When they realized what they had done, how they had sinned against God, how they had broken His law, how they had returned to the sinful ways of their fathers, what did they do? The Bible says the people wept very sore. Look in chapter six, or I'm sorry, chapter ten and verse number six. The Bible says, Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he had come thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water. Why? For he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. They were sorry for their sin. When's the last time you mourned and wept over your sin? Why is it such a big deal? You know, as we live our lives, we all, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. In this life, we will never be sinless people. We carry with us our flesh. And there are things that, that are opposed to our Christian lives, the world, the flesh, the devil. I'm going to sin. Don't hold it against me. But sometimes we just make a cute little excuse for it. Sweep it under the rug like it was no big deal. The Bible says, He that covered his sin shall not prosper. You know, as we live our lives, we're going to sin. We may sin against one another. You know, I may do something that hurts you. I apologize in advance. But my sin is not just a sin against you, nor is it a sin simply against me and those I love. Why ought we mourn? Why ought we, why, what is the magnitude of our sin? Against whom have we truly sinned? God. Look back at what the Bible says in Ezra chapter 10. In verse 2, Right in the middle of the verse, the Bible says, We have trespassed against our God. We have trespassed against our God. Who do you sin against? You sin against God. My sin affects others without question, but ultimately, my sin, every sin I commit, is a sin against my God. What is sin? If we were to define sin, of course, we could define it in many different ways, but I think we ought to simply just define it biblically. How about that? The Bible says that sin is the transgression of God's law. We read His Word, we disobey it. We read His Word, we understand what God wants. This is the way, walk ye in it. Turn not from the right hand or to the left. This is God's Word. This is not up for debate or discussion. This is God's Word. Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. The words of the Lord are pure words. Not one jot or tittle will pass from the law till all be fulfilled. This generation will pass away, but My Word shall not pass away. We read the Word of God. And we know what God tells us to do. We know what God tells us not to do. But we do what we want anyway. You know what the Bible says? He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We sin against God. We sin against the holy God, a righteous God, a just God. 
Turning your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. And note what the Word of God says there concerning repentance and sorrow. When we understand that our sin is against God, it does something to us. At least it ought to. It ought to do to us what it did to the remnant when they saw what they had done, when they saw how they had sinned against God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 10, notice what the Bible says. It says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. <laughs> To salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Are we truly sorry? They were sorry. The Bible says they wept sore, that they mourned, that they did not eat or drink because of their sin. Because they sinned against God. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And notice what the Bible says here. David, of course, this is his prayer for forgiveness. He had been caught in sin with Bathsheba. He murdered her husband after he found out she was expecting a child. He thought he could just get away with, with adultery, but you're not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Well, he's just been confronted by the prophet Nathan, and now he is, he is penitent. He's repentant. And the Bible says in verse 1, it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Look what the Bible says in verse number 4. It says, against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and clear when thou judgest. Friends, if we're going to have revival, we've got to take sin seriously. You know, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of places you could go and they just excuse it away. Oh, oh it's, it's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Every sin is a big deal. For what sin did Jesus not die? Was it lying? Well, it was just a little white lie. I mean, it didn't really hurt anything, did it? A lie is a lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, I just, you know, I, I just can't help myself, right? That says that we are not to be covetous. Flee fornication. Friends, every sin is serious. We must recognize the magnitude of our sin. Notice the second thing you, ought, you and I ought to do. Back in Ezra chapter 10, it's simple. We must confess and forsake our sin. Confess and forsake our sin. Look what the Bible says in verses 11 and 12 of Ezra chapter 10. The Bible says, Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. They confessed. They separated themselves. They confessed their sin. They, they separated from it. They confessed it, and they forsook their sin. What does the word confess mean? Turn your Bibles to 1 John Chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible tells us we are to confess. It says, if we confess our sin, look there, 
If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's that word confess. What does confess mean? Why, why should I give confession to God? You don't have to give confession to me. You didn't sin against me. You sinned against God. You confess to God. Say, God, what you did was wrong. The word confess, write this down. This is a simple definition of the word confess. It means to agree with God. God, I agree with you. I agree that it is sin. That what I have done has brought you no pleasure. I confess it. I know it's wrong. You know the greatest thing? is if we confess our sins. Look what it says there in verse 9. He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's still one more thing we ought to do. We must forsake our sin. You know, a lot of times what we do is we confess it. You know, we come, we pray at the altar, and we confess our sin to God, and then when we're done, we just pick it up and take it back to our seat with us. Why are we sad? Are we sad because there's guilt? Are we sad because we got caught? Or are we sad because it is sin? And it's broken God's law. God wants us to forsake that sin. He wants us to take that sin and get rid of it. To cast it aside. To not bring it back with us. To, 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 get, to get it, eradicate it from our lives. Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Look what the Word of God says in verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near. In verse 7 he says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. But there has to be a forsaking, a complete and utter abandonment. We must renounce these things. I was watching a political convention this week. Must have been Tuesday night, maybe, when they had the naturalization oath. Some immigrants who've worked really hard came to our nation, assimilated into our culture, learned our history. I hope it was, I hope it was accurate history, not the 1618 junk. But um, beside the point, bringing it back. But you know what they did? They renounced their allegiance to foreign powers. They renounced their loyalty to any other government, people, or nation. You and I, we're not of this earth. This world is not our home. 
We're just sojourners here. And what the Lord wants us to do, He says, listen, I've saved you, I've bought you with a price, now glorify Me and renounce your sinfulness. Renounce it. Separate yourselves from it. Forsake it. And swear allegiance to Me. That's what God desires. He wants us to agree with Him concerning our sin. And swear our allegiance to Him. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I don't want to serve my flesh anymore. I don't want to serve myself any longer. So I confess and I forsake. You know what's the third thing you and I ought to do? Because there's hope. We just move forward by faith. Live for God by faith. Look what it says again in verse 12, back in Ezra chapter 10. The Bible says, Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, and mark this statement in your Bible. It says, As thou hast said, so must we do. As thou hast said, so must we do. I wonder what God would do in our lives. I wonder what God would do in our homes. I wonder what God would do in our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world. If we would say that and do it. As thou hast said, so must we do. I wonder what God would do if we just decided right now to be completely obedient. To take God at His word and live for Him by faith. What do you think God would do? I'm going to make a statement, just my belief, you can take it for what it's worth. I believe we are holding God back from so much of what He wants to do because we are unwilling to be completely obedient. people of God, they said, you know what? Whatever you say, God, we're going to do it. God, whatever you say, whatever you say, doesn't matter how hard it is, doesn't matter how easy it is, how culturally acceptable it might be, it's going to do it. What do you say? You know what happened because they did this? Revival. Do you want revival? I do. I really desperately do. Will you recognize the magnitude? of your sin? Will you confess it and forsake it? And will you move forward by faith? Will you follow God? Will you live your life by faith in God? Obeying Him. Taking God at His word. Walking in truth. Will you do it? Imagine. Just imagine. What God will do in your life, in your home, in the lives of your children, your grandchildren, this church, 
this city, this world, with a group of people like this. who yield themselves completely to God. It was several weeks ago, sharing the story of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody made the statement, he said, the world has not yet seen what God could do through a man who is completely surrendered to him. And he said, by God's grace, I'm going to be that man. Will you be that one? Let's all stand together, our heads bowed and our eyes closed.